Remember I said earlier on in the module that these series of lectures today, next week on grounded theory or hermeneutic approaches, the week after that when I look at uh, um, uh, narrative approaches and then into um, Tracy's sessions on discourse analysis, are a kind of progression of different kinds of philosophical position about an, uh, qualitative analysis. And they start this week with what you might call a very realist approach, an approach where, where the, the theorists tend to assume that what is said is what is happening. Uh, that, in other words, that, that the, the interviews or, or the, the, um, the ethnographies, if you like, the, the, the transcripts they're working on, are a, a record of something actually happening in the world. And therefore, we can ask questions about whether it actually did happen or not, and whether it really happened and so on. Because we can say, you know, it, does it kind of in some way match up to what happened in the world? That's at one end, the realist position. Of course, at the other end is the constructivist position, which is probably illustrated best of all by something like discourse analysis, where essentially you say there are simply discourses. There is no real world with which we can compare the, the actual transcripts or the interviews. Rather, they're just simply what people say, the way they interpret the world, the way they, they set up their discourses, or their, their, the way that they structure the world from their perspective. And all we can do is capture that and, and look at it with any kind of assumption that whether it's true or not, whether it actually happened or not. So the, co the, so the focus there is much more on how people are using language, what they're trying to do with the language, and so on. Whereas in these approaches, that I'm starting with this week, the emphasis is much more on what actually happened, what's going on, what, what did people do, and so on, and taking that, in a sense, on trust. Um, now, the other issue that, um, that comes up here as well is, is um, whether it's inductive or deductive. And this approach today is certainly deductive. In other words, these approaches tend to start with an hypothesis, some kind of statement based upon an existing theory, which is then worked upon. You then look at the data to see whether you can confirm it or whether you need to amend it in some way. And a lot of the work actually is about amending the hypothesis. But you start with that kind of deductive approach. Um, you put forward a hypothesis and then you try to, in a sense to use Popper's terms, you try to refute it. You try to, to show it's not right or you try to revise it in various ways. <clears throat> On the other hand, the approaches that come later, like narrative and discursive approaches and so on, are much more inductive. And in fact, what I'll talk about next week, the grounded theory approach, puts itself forward as an inductive approach. The idea here is that rather than coming with a, a hypothesis to start with, you look at the data and develop ideas from it. So you're inducing, in a sense, or inducting from the data uh, to get your ideas and your explanations and so on. So this is very much a, a deductive approach to, as we'll see in just a moment. Okay, so this approach is most commonly known as analytic induction. And um, that's the term that's, that's most often used, and you'll, you'll see it used in, in various texts, um, to describe this kind of approach. Uh, it dates right back, I think, to the 1950s originally, although some people claim that actually it was developed by two researchers um, way back before the, the Second World War, uh, Thomas and Zinecki, who did a, a classic study of the Polish peasantry. Um, and um, they claimed that they were using an analytic inductive approach in that, although they didn't call it that as such. But it was called analytic induction in the 50s and onwards. Um, it's probably an approach that's most commonly used in evaluation of policy studies, um, you know, health areas and things like this, health policy. Um, criminal, criminal justice areas and so on, because these are areas where, in a sense, you're concerned with, you know, policy, how should we do things, and what, what, yeah, well, are we doing it the right way, kind of evaluation type questions as well, where you want to know from people what actually happened, what's going on, that, that's an issue um, that you really want to get to grips with. What it does, as I said here, is it uses a set of procedures as a way of overcoming um, some of the, the problems with, with analysis, which we've seen some already in the, in the video, um, but, but the way of establishing an explanation and causal links between the data and the explanation, and I'll, I'll go through some of those iterative procedures in a moment. But, just to re-emphasise the point I made already, this approach is realist, it tends to assume that 
the, the meanings in the text are transparent. It's, it's quite clear what people meant. You know, that's, it's there. There's very little in the way of interpretation going on here. It's taking them as, in a sense, as a, or as you might say, as gospel. This is what happened. This is what, what people said. This is what they, they did and so on in that. So you don't ask questions of what do people mean by this and you don't ask questions of what were they trying to do when they were doing this um, and so on. Those are not questions that the, the, this, this approach tends to ask. But I have to say, I mean, it isn't much used these days. I'll come back to the, the, this as one of the, the, the problems with it later on, but it isn't much used these days. But I think it's important to talk about it because actually one of the things that is distinctive about this kind of approach particularly analytic induction, is the iterative nature of it, that you do something and you redo it and redo it, going around in a kind of cycle to reanalyze things. And that's not uncommon in other much more common techniques these days. So if we're talking about things like um, thematic analysis, uh, Jonathan Smith's interpretive phenomenological analysis, maybe even framework analysis to some extent, the idea of, of going through some kind of iterative process is, is quite central to their approaches as well. So it, it, it takes that from, from analytic induction. The reasons why the res early researchers felt this was needed was because they were sceptical about the qualitative analyst. Uh, and this, and I'm going to zip through this quite quickly because I'm sure these are things we're all familiar with, that the problems of doing qualitative analysis. Um, the one that you've already come across, remember this discussed in a previous session, somebody said <laughs> there's a lot of data coming out here. Well, there, there is. I mean, you know, enormous amounts of data are generated both by interviews and ethnographies and also by, through the process of analysis itself. So there's a lot of things to get a hold of and get your head around. And that can lead to all kinds of problems of, of analysis. Hence the need for a structured approach to try to get to grips with that. You tend to be biased by the things you first come across. You know, early things tend to bias your thinking about things and it's, it's important not to get bogged down in that, that first interpretation. Um, things that's easy to get hold of, you know, things that you can understand easily and, and the interviews that, that, that kind of told you things uh, quite early on will tend to dominate your views. And also you'll tend to get your own ideas confirmed um, by, by what you're reading and you tend to remember those confirmations more than looking for what are called negative cases, those examples, those episodes and so on which disconfirm what you're trying to do. You tend to discount the novel and you don't treat everything reliably and, and, and equally uh, when, when analysing. And it goes on. Um, you know, there's a tendency to, to misinformation, to, you know, because it's so much of it, you tend to miss things out and, and not look at things properly, not give everything the same kind of, of weight. You tend either to over-revise hypotheses or under-revise. You stick with your initial ideas and never change them. Or you change them so radically and so often that you get completely messed and, and, uh, and lost. Um, other one or two other things, assumptions about fictional bases tend to assume uh, some kind of average, some kind of norm with which you're comparing your, your own data, which may not be true at all, um, but, but it gives you a kind of bias view of what you're getting. Um, and of course, you may put more confidence in your own judgment than you should. Maybe you, know, you need to look at the data more to see if it's uh, supported. And even non-occurrence uh, can be seen as evidence for, for strong correlation when it, when, it, uh, when it happens. So all of this means that there are genuine threats to reliability, generalizability, and validity if you're not careful in the way you go through the data. And the way that this approach suggests we, are, we are deal with those problems is by being very structured, uh, by using procedures and going through those procedures in a repetitive or iterative kind of way. So by, by making sure we give everything the same weight, we look through everything and don't miss things, and we do it in a repeated fashion, we can overcome some of these kinds of biases.